Alrighty, I'm girl. Hey what guys, have now? my name is Anna from New Jersey. To on this channel, Illinois, I do my makeup, we're we doing things in the past of the radium doll. Using things related history and all that. So I'm gonna sit here and do my makeup. We and are you doing about the second half of my last girls video in this company. So, Radium Doll Company actually started in 1917. It was based in Chicago. Then it moved to Peru, Illinois in 1920. And then it kind of just opened a branch of Ottawa in Ottawa, Illinois. And 1922, there was a small advertisement appeared wanting to employ 18 girl, girls over 18, 18 and over. for fine brushwork and they uh and they had to have all the interest go through miss murray who was going to be the supervisor ottawa was described as a very super close-knit catholic community and the girls that ended up getting hired for this company were instructed to do the lip pointing a lot of girls did lie about their age on their application um, some of the youngest girls were 11 years old. One of the assistants, Mercy Reed, in order to show that the material was harmless, would actually eat the luminous paint, like the material, with a spatula. And she would just eat it up and lick it right in front of them. While the girls in New Jersey had to be brushed off at the end of the day, the girls in Ottawa were encouraged to paint their nails with it, so their nails would glow with the dark. They would paint fake rings and fingers on their fingers, and they would paint their dresses. A lot of girls didn't make use of the washing facilities there too, and a lot of girls ate, the, ate around the material for lunch. The girls were so glowingly that a lot of the people in the town just started jokingly calling them the ghost girls. And it was deemed as a mark of pride for these girls. They were the ghost girls. They were the ones chosen to have this absolutely amazing job. They had about 200 girls employed with them by 1923. They would hire about like 10 girls at, at a time. And they would see which one stuck, and then they would just go and, at the end of the charting period, only keep half of the girls to stay permanently. A lot of these girls were actually the ones making their money for their family. And a lot of them come from, like, five or more kids. They came from extremely large families, which were really common at the time. These girls were going to parties. When they would go to the parties, they would paint their hair, their party clothes. Would They would just wear it to work, so their party clothes would glow. So they would wear their work dresses, their party dresses to work, and then just immediately go to the parties, and they would be glowing. During lunch, they would go in the dark room and paint each other's eyebrows, their lips, their eyelashes. They would play with the paint. They believed it to be one of the best places to work. Mr. Reed, one of the assistants, was deaf. So they would end up like, every time he yelled at them, they would just talk back to him as a joke. And really just enjoyed life there. They were just having an amazing time for Radium Dial. Working for Radium Dial. Uh, in 1925, they ended up hearing a Marguerite's lawsuit. The company did, not the girls. And they decided to start scheming so the girls of Radium Dial would not catch on. The reason the company heard of this is because the radium industry was really just a small pond. And if you worked in it, you knew everyone. That's how kind of small of a pond it was. So they actually decided to open a second location in Strader, 16 miles down south. No one really knew of radium in this town. They just knew it was a company coming and they were painting clocks. No one knew what the material was for this town. A lot of the workers transferred, but others just lost their job and did not continue on with the company. They tested some of the girls conducted by a company doctor. The girls were not told the results of their test. And... 
the companies knew by then what girls were considered radioactive or going to be radioactive and which ones were hiding and the girls just knew nothing they still lit painted even though this method had been banned with united states radium court and they tried to find an alternative method nothing really stick and still at this time none of the girls knew what was going on they were just living life but some of them were starting to feel like a bit run down they're starting to feel exhausted but they believed it was nothing they just believed it was from them working living life everyone gets like that sometimes so they really barely completely realized that a government inspector had come to check on the corporation and the girls that spring and it was due to the new jersey cases that actually caused a complete nationwide investigation to all facilities that worked with radium at the time this was led by the an agent of labor statistics named swing Kajir. He went first to the lab in Chicago where lab workers had lesions on their finger. They had safeguards to help them protect lab workers, to protect them. And the lab workers knew that it was dangerous. Operators were also protected by lead screens and given just free vacation time to help reduce their exposure. But he arrived to the Ottawa paint facility in April 20th. He's spoke to miss murray who had no idea radium could make anyone sick she claimed that it was actually an improvement on the girl's health then she asked about the lip pointing and she told him that they provided water to use but all the girls whip pointed he witnessed all the girls pointing and when he got a picture of the studio for reference there were no containers of water for the girls to even have the option of using he asked Dennis if they had witnessed anything strange with the girls coming in with pain. And at the time, no girls had really come complaining like the girls in New Jersey. A few weeks into the study, the boss actually just cut the study short because he believed that only USCR was the problem. That's how all the research was coming out to be. With the other investigations, it was just an USCR problem. None of the other facilities had it. But Kajir had come to the conclusion that it was actually very dangerous. Just no one had told the girls that problem. The next few years, still everything was normal for the girls. They worked on, continued having their lives. No knowledge what they were doing was killing them. Ella Cruz did get sick during this time and she passed away. September 4th, 1927. It was only after the court case of Catherine Quinta Albina and Edna in New Jersey that made international news that the girls found out remotely any cover-ups had been going on or anything had been going on that they were possibly going to get sick. None of them knew that up until it made news and it showed in the newspaper. And the girls were legitly terrified. Their friend had died back in September, and no one knew why. Other workers had started to get sick or were already sick. Um, they The company had meetings to discuss it, and it almost broke out into riots because of how terrified and how pissed off these girls were about the information. He told the girls that there was no such thing as radium poisoning. Three days after the New Jersey settlement, the girls learned their test results by a full-page ad in the newspaper claiming nothing similar had been found in the girls, that the New Jersey girls were using methathorum, not radium. And if you did not watch our last video or you don't know, methathorum is a isotope of radium that has a half-life of 6.7 years instead of the normal 1,600 years of radium. Next day, Ella's family <laughs> filed a lawsuit against the company. They weren't going to put up with any cover-ups 
anything like that, they went ahead and filed the lawsuit with their family lawyer. February 26, 1929, Kajir went to the hearing just to see what was going on. And nothing was, like, really happening. The lawyer was a family lawyer requested to postpone it because no one knew about radium poisoning. That wasn't anything the doctors were talking about. With this area, they weren't medically advanced as New York, Chicago, all these other big cities. They just didn't know anything about it. The family was just claiming $3,750. Nothing would really come out of this case because they couldn't pay to exhume her body for an actual autopsy. Catherine Wolf around this time started to get sick and she had a really bad limp and she was just fainting, had a bunch of fainting spells. When she asked Mr. Reed about this to see the company doctor, he refused. Even though her reports for the company did state she was radioactive. Peg Looney was getting really sick at this time too. Her teeth were pulled that never healed. Amnema hit pain so bad she could barely walk. That sounds very similar to how the New Jersey girl started with their stuff. What I found was really cute is they did bring up at the time her fiance would pull her around in a little like wagon around the town when she couldn't walk. I'm just saying, like, that's, I thought that was, like, incredibly sad, but incredibly romantic, too. Kajir warned the company that the government was watching them very closely because that both, co both girls had tested positive for being radioactive in 1925 and 1928, and Catherine actually collapsed. On August 6, 1929, no, Peg had collapsed August 26, 1929, and she was admitted to the hospital. She died August 14, 1929, and the company men came and took her, tried to take her in the middle of the night. All of this screams cover-up, which we know that by now, but all of this just screams cover-up. And it was actually Peg's brother-in-law, Jack, that stopped them. Peg was a die-hard Catholic. And through hell or high water, Jack was going to make sure that, that she had a Catholic funeral in a mass. The family was like, this is sketchy. Something is up. So they asked the family doctor to do an autopsy on her. And so the company gave the doctor a time. But they gave him the wrong time because he showed up and the autopsy had been done an hour before. The family was not sent a copy. The official cause of her death was diphtheria, And it is a serious bacterial infection that affects the mucous membranes of your nose and throat. Even though... Later on, they will admit there were obvious signs of radium poisoning in her body. The company even put the official death and tried to clear their name in her obituary. Another girl, Mary Tolini, died February 22nd, 1930. In the fall of the previous year, she had had surgery. After quitting her job, she had found one of the sarcoma on her back. In August of 1931, they had fired, just fired, plain out fired Catherine Wolf for having a limp. She was pissed. She had given nine years of her life to that studio. She was pissed. If she got sick, she was going to fight. She ended up getting married in January 1923 to a man named Tom. And he is actually really relevant to her story later on. That's why I mentioned their marriage. 
instead of all the other marriages I've talked about because he really does play a big relevant part in this at some point. By 1933, almost all the original, original so girls had either been laid off the fact or they had Catherine's quit. Catherine's jaw was completely and the utterly hurting. Quit the company. fact that Charlotte's elbow caused her so much pain and she could barely hold stuff. The fact Maria's legs were killing her. And then there was also another girl at the time getting sick named Mary Robinson. But none of the girls believed that they had radium poisoning and were just brushing off, claiming that the girls were completely fine. March 1923, Tom went to Chicago, brought down a doctor named Charles Loeffler, who was a blood specialist. He could not diagnose it right away, but he did admit that their blood held toxic things, like were toxic. The next time Loeffler was in Ottawa, he saw Charlotte, who had him check the lump on her elbow, because it had gotten to the size of a golf ball. Before then, she had saw 15 different doctors in Chicago who just had no idea what was going on with her. A lot of the girls ended up going to see him, Helen Munch, Olivia Witt, and Nas Vallett, Marie Roster, Frances, and Marguerite Glansky. He traveled to Ottawa every weekend in March and April, and on April 10th, Charlotte just couldn't wait because of her arm, and she went to see Dr. Marshall Davidson, who told her in order to save her life, she must have her arm amputated. So she went ahead and got her arm amputated so it could save her life. April... Catherine got the news that she did, in fact, have radium poisoning. Charlotte had also gotten the same news while she was in Chicago getting, you know, her arm amputated. When Tonk flat out called Mr. Reed in the street as soon as he found out the next time he saw him. And was like, hey, the pain is killing the girls. We just got the confirmation from a doctor. And Mr. Reed goes, couldn't be. You're lying. So, Dr. Lawford calls the vice president of the company to let him know because he already had the knowledge. But it wasn't a shock to the president of the company because they had known in 1928 over half the girls were radioactive and he refused to do anything. And so, he ends up taking him to a lawyer named Jay Cook, who is with the Illinois Industrial Commission. They wrote letters to the company. No one responded on it. So they decided to confront their old manager. When Catherine and Charlotte went into the building and confronted Mr. Mary Robinson died the early March, and it was the healthy. first cause of death by radium poisoning in Ottawa because the doctors had actually just sent her bones away to get it confirmed. There was no denying it, literally now. But the doctors in Ottawa were straight up like, no, nah, it doesn't exist. And stated that work was not related to the cause of death. Because they had something against the hot, shoddy doctors of the big cities. And that's just still something you see in small towns. People get really angry and annoyed and possessive when you bring up big cities. It's just something that's still going to be there forever, I believe, with small towns. And so, 1934, a huge group of the girls sued the company for over $50,000 apiece. The summer, it was filed in two different courts. One, just the normal court, and one, the Illinois Industrial Commissions. The town really resented these women because this had been one of the companies that had still been there and still prospered during the Great Depression. So, they saw this company as kind of heroes because without the company, a lot of these people would have died and starved during the Great Depression. 
that they really just turned their backs away on the girls. The radium dower power changed in October 1934, and the former president lost power, so he passive-aggressively opened a new dial painting company, like, two blocks down in the town. And he named it Luminous Process, and he just tried to hire all the current radium dial workers. A lot of them did go, a lot of them didn't. And he was claiming that the girls were sick with radium poisoning, but that was because of the fact, I'm deciding what to do with my makeup. Do blue. And they weren't going to have them putting it in their mouth. They are going to have a different way. And they did get some protection. They had little, like, thin cotton smocks. And their paint was on a spatula. And they used the spatula to clean and apply the paint to the dial. So they did not have to lit point which was a big progress at the time april 1935 the court ruled against legislation because they failed to establish a standard by which compliance with the law could actually be measured and it was and the, the company pretty much at the court case admitted that they had poisoned these girls and it existed and they covered it up and they were like, oh, what are you going to do about it? So, Cook left the case, even though they still had the ability to win with the Illinois Industrial Commission. He just up and left. And most of the girls' were, finances were completely messed up and didn't know what to do with it. The Chicago press thought it was a great act of injustice and would interview the girls. And that's kind of how they would get their income at the time was through that. Um, Inez died February 25th, 1936. Due to all of this, the Occupational Disease Act was actually updated in Illinois to include provisions for industrial poisoning. But it did not become law until 1936, October of 1936. But back in May of that year, Tom wanted his wife's medical record from when she worked there, and the company denied it. And Tom was pissed. He got a fight, got arrested again. And so, December of that year, the company just up and left. <laughs> they decided they were done with Ottawa, Illinois. They had the competition plant. They had this lawsuit. They just decided to say nope and nope out. And so, the girls had a court case in July of 1937 in the Illinois Industrial Commission Court. And the company's vanishing act did not help the girls. The company was found on New York's Lower East Side and they did not have a lawyer until two days before the hearing where we have Leonard Grossman who was a lawyer who if you couldn't pay him that was fine. You had a court case that was severe enough to need a really strong defense. He had done a lot of unions he was a grand postponent he just if he did a lot of the riots a lot of the labor unions he was a big industrial worker lawyer so he got because he was just on the case postponed for february 10th 1938 and during the February trial, Catherine actually pulled a piece of her jawbone out of a jewelry box she had with her. She was up on the stand, and she pulled out a little jewelry box, and she pulled out two pieces, and she stated, 
these are my doll bound. Like, that would be terrifying to witness if I was in a court. That would, like, legitly be terrifying. So, the girls finding out, the girls actually also found out that their condition was completely fatal during this time. And Catherine realized, because at the time she had her husband and she had two kids. And she was one of the ones that was faring the worst at that point. She actually ended up screaming in mass hysteria in the courtroom when she realized, even if she won the case, it was going to kill her. And she would not, she wouldn't get the chance to see her two kids grow up. She wouldn't have the chance to spend a long time like she had planned with her husband. This had, even if she won, her life was taken away due to this. So, she did not go the next day to the trial. Her husband was like, you're not going. And she stayed home. And he found out only then that the doctors had suggested that she only had months to live. As, like, the, when she left. The next day, she did give testimony at her bedside. They brought the jury, judge, all that to her house. And admitted that no one had told them lip painting at some point of their employment had been condemned at, by the U.S. government. And she actually, on her technical death couch, showed how they were instructed to lip point. And records say that her husband literally just sat there sobbing because he hadn't seen what the girls were doing at the facility and got to see what had, what small minuscule things had actually killed his wife at the time. Which that, that would be like legitly heartbreaking. Like I remember reading that and just sitting there sobbing. For like a solid minute. That would be awful and terrifying. And April 5th, they did find the company guilty. They tried to file an appeal that was thrown, just completely thrown out July 6th. Catherine died July 27th, so she did only have a few months to live. And she left her husband and her two children. This day, Radium filed a second appeal. And Grossman was now furious. He was fighting the company now in her honor. And he actually got the license to take this trial all the way to the Supreme Court. So that if they won in the Supreme Court. There would not be a chance for appeal. So, Radium Dial would be forever found guilty. He fought Catherine's case eight times in one. The last time he fought the case was October 23rd, 1923, with the Supreme Court. And he won it. Catherine's husband, Tom, he actually passed away... May 8th, 1958, and he lived in the house Catherine and him had. Catherine and him raised their children for the small, for the short, small time that she was alive with her children, and Tom never married after Catherine died. He loved her so much, he just couldn't see himself getting married. And actually, in 19, 1984, Catherine's daughter allowed the center of human radiology.
to take Catherine's home, her body, so they could use it for radiation testing. And that's what a lot of the Ottawa girls actually did once that company came out after World War II. Is their families either let their bodies temporarily be taken. I messed that up. This eye twitches when I do liner, so. But I thought it looked good with this look. They actually, that's what a lot of them did. I don't do liner a lot, so. That's what a lot of the company actually, girls actually did when this company was founded. They allowed it. Pearl lived to be 98 years old. Charlotte lived to be 82, Marie died in 1993, and she flat out donated her body to science. Peg was exhumed 1987, and she was found to have 19,500 microcuries of radium in her body. And that is more than 100,000 times the safe amount. Of the highest quality found. But in September 11th, Ottawa did present a barn statue dedicated to all women of any radium company. And it was a woman standing on a clock, a brush in one hand, and a flower in the other. And they used that to honor the girls who had died due to the horrors of the company that they wanted to ignore which I think that's a really nice thing to do so these are the girls of radium dial and these are the last style painter girls I'll be talking about next week I'm actually really excited for the topic because it's a topic I'm really interested in strangely and I learned a lot more than I thought I had like I thought I knew everything with it, but I learned a lot more. So I'm very excited for next week. So I hope you will come back and join me. Bye. <laughs>